Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Well, the FDA, I think, has finally got it right. Uh, they met and they've decided that the, uh, for the next vaccine in the fall should really be focused on XBB. So that was good. What was a little surprising to me, but makes sense, I think, uh, is that they're not going to even use the original Wuhan virus, the, uh, the isolate from Wuhan, or any of the other ones. So it's going to be mostly XBB variants. Uh, and they will decide in the fall, much like they do uh, with flu. There's a panel of people. Uh, the reason they can't decide now is because there's still a lot of virus replicating in the world, as I'll show you. And uh, as a result, there will, there will continue to be mutations. But right now, uh, XBB and its related variants are the dominant strains. 99.8% of all the strains now are XBB related. Uh, with XBB 1.5 being 39.9% and XBB 1.16 being 18.2%, but, but they're all related. So that's good if we haven't had a recombinant event. So if you have an immune response to getting uh, Omicron now, you're likely to be protected for the next six to seven months. But if you think about it, by the time the summer goes by, and the fall arrives and we start going indoors again, it's likely that there'll be a, a resurgence as our immunity wanes for the people who have not been infected with XBB, we're likely to see a seasonal kind of flu-like syndrome uh, happen annually. And so th uh, this is the right thing to do, but I, what I'm hoping, they didn't say it, but I'm hoping they do a trivalent uh, and pick two of the most, uh, most dominant strains and maybe one of the Omicron varieties, but we'll see, that's up to that panel. As I said, there's a lot of virus around. Uh, it's beginning to look a little bit better. You remember a couple of weeks ago, 42% of the wastewater sites were reporting uh, either significant increases, large increases of 100% or more, or smaller increases of zero to 100%, that's the orange. It's down to about 37% are now reporting these increases. But so 37% of the sites in the United States are reporting increases in virus. And if you look at just the wastewater detection, can you detect coronavirus in wastewater? <laughs> that's, the, that's the map. It's everywhere. It's all over the place. The best news, though, is that if they say, what is the detectable wastewater in the last 15 days, mostly they're blue dots. In other words, it's coming, beginning to fall in most of those places. So that's good. Now, in Houston, uh, this is what it looked like December 21st, 2020. Everything was up. It was 240% over when they got their first sample, July 6th, 2020. Now it's one half the, the amount that was present July 6th, 2020. So continuing to fall, but still 50% level of what it was in the height of the pandemic. You know, so we still have virus around. Now there's been a lot of flu-like illnesses going around. And I mentioned before that uh, metanuma virus was, was a lot responsible for that. So I asked our folks who are doing the sequencing Tony Mresso and his colleagues, and there doesn't seem to seem to be a lot of metanuma virus right now. So, not sure what when people get an upper respiratory infection and it's non it's COVID negative. Not sure what it is. Maybe we'll be able to figure that out in the next couple of weeks. So there's some really interesting papers that I thought I'd just uh, uh, I'd follow up with because uh, they have some uh, <laughs> some more studies that show ivermectin doesn't work. Anyway, there was a really interesting study uh, that was just published in the Lancet this uh, this month that looked at a multicenter randomized quadruple blind parallel group phase three trial. What well, that's a lot of words to say. They had many different uh, three different possible interventions, and to see whether people who were obese and they were treated with metformin in addition to other treatments would reduce their long COVID exposure. And they looked at many, many patients between the ages of 30 to 85, they were all had to be overweight. And, and basically uh, there were people who got symptomatically ill within seven days had SARS-CoV-2 positive by PCR or antigen, and then they started treatment. And then looked uh, 10 months later to see how many people had long COVID uh, uh, symptoms. And basically it was 6.3% of the people who received metformin versus 10.4% of people who, who received placebo didn't get metformin. So metformin was very effective. Now metformin is a, a, a medic medication used for diabetics, type two diabetes. It enhances insulin sensitivity in the periphery. And so, uh, you know, we, it's one thing to consider. If you have a, uh, an obese patient or BMI over 31, uh, 
it's close to what I am. Uh, you, you should at least consider metformin in the future for therapy. So that was very interesting because there's been a lot of uh, interesting studies about how uh, the impact of, of, uh, of COVID on, uh, on diabetes control. One of the reasons I thought it would be review this study is ivermectin is one of the treatment arms. Ivermectin had absolutely no uh, effect whatsoever. Uh, and so, and as, as did fluvoxamine, another one that was considered possibly effective, and neither of those drugs had any impact at all. So one more study that shows, while well, ivermectin is for, terrific for parasitic disease, it doesn't have any impact on COVID. Uh, then, <laughs> so this is my, my sister. My sister asked me like, I know, all the, I know all the trouble with lockdowns. We know it was bad. Uh, you know, it was bad for the economy and a lot of isolation and mental illness. Was there anything good that came of the lockdowns? So those are the kinds of questions I get from my sister. Janet, I don't know. So I'd looked high and low to find was there anything good that came of the lockdowns. Well, it turns out <laughs> there was. Uh, so this is one study that looked at uh, GPS tracking from 2300 individual mammals of 43 species, and they looked at their movement patterns. And what they found was that during the lockdowns, the uh, movement of these animals increased by 70%. So, we, so what that means is when people are around, we're, we're forcing animals to, to stay where they are. When we disappear, animals start moving around, all these mammalian species. So, I love this. There's a raccoon hanging out in New York City. Here's a deer crossing the street in, in Nara, Japan. This is my favorite. This is a sea lion in Buenos Aires waiting for the store to open so he can get some fresh fish. Of course, <laughs> jackals howling in Tel Aviv. Monkeys, <laughs> monkeys dancing in the streets in India. And of course, with no traffic, dogs are chilling in the middle of the streets of India as well. But this, of all my favorite, this is reverse uh, uh, shopping. This is goats who are looking probably for sweaters in Wales. Awesome. So there was a lot. I mean, it shows that we are we're suppressing a lot of the movement of, of other species. And as soon as people disappear, uh, they get a little freedom. So they had a great time during the lockdown. I think there, there was a much reduced uh, depression in goats in, in Wales. Now, what about the planet? So these are great studies from, uh, from NASA. They looked at nitrogen dioxide content and particulate matter in the atmosphere. And what they found during the lockdown was that there was a 60% reduction in nitrogen dioxide and 31% uh, reduction in particulate matter, uh, which is really kind of ama amazing. And they thought mostly that was due to uh, the transportation uh, world. So <laughs> I'm not sure how this one fits in, but the water in Venice even cleared. Anyway. This is a picture of the East Coast. Uh, you can see a 30% improvement in nit uh, nitrogen dioxide over New York City and the New Jersey and Connecticut. And this is the most dramatic one. If you look at China, this is before the lockdown and after the lockdown, Beijing and Shanghai are actually clear. And if you've ever been to Beijing, you can't see anything in Beijing all the time. So that, that's, uh, those are some interesting studies, the benefits of lockdowns. So I want to end today with uh, a couple of shout outs. Uh, first of all, this is uh, the month where we celebrate Juneteenth and, and Pride Month. As you know, Juneteenth, uh, we celebrated this past Monday, June 19th. Uh, and it has a particular meaning for Texas because that was actually uh, when the Union Army came down and, and to Galveston, Texas and posted uh, the Emancipation Pro Proclamation uh, two and a half years after it was signed. So it, even though it was signed by President Lincoln. It didn't end slavery until the, the um, uh, Union Army came down and, and enforced it. So it, it's very important to the state of Texas, and it started in Galveston. Also, Pride Month, we celebrate throughout June. Many better faculty and staff and students are participating in the Houston Pride LGBT and parade, uh, Plus Parade in downtown Houston on Saturday, June 24th. Uh, that's always fun. Uh, and others have uh, in the Baylor community have signed up to volunteer for that uh, for that event. So, congratulations to everybody who's going to enjoy that event. Anyway, I want you to have a great uh, weekend, and I can't wait to see you next week. <laughs>